Okay, well, I guess um, we'll get started here. Uh, my name is Darren Pearson, and I'm going to be giving uh, a presentation called Creating Video Games with, with Tumult Hype. So, uh, let's see here. There we go. Uh, so, like I said, my name is Darren Pearson, and my background is I'm an instructor at St. Paul College, which is a two year community college uh, in Minnesota. And um, I've been working there for, for quite a few years. And I'm kind of a rare, there's a nice shot of what the college looks like. Uh, and I'm kind of a rarity over there because I work half the time in the computer science department and I work half the time in digital graphics. Uh, DGIM, digital graphics and interactive multimedia. So um, on the CSI side of things, I mainly teach the web classes. So I'll teach the intro to HTML, uh, JavaScript, PHP, that kind of stuff. I stay away from, uh, you know, from some of the other uh, database and programming classes and things like that. And on DGIM side, uh, we've been teaching the uh, you know, Photoshop, Illustrator, uh, 3D animation, 2D animation, all that kind of stuff, and that's kind of uh, sort of where hype uh, fits in. Um, now, just a, just a side note here, um, I am from St. Paul, not Minneapolis. On one of the earlier versions, uh, somebody accidentally said, you know, Darren's from St. Paul College in Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, and I said, you know, I called up uh, Brad and Peggy, and I said, you know, I'm actually from St. Paul, you know, I'm from the Twin Cities, which includes both of them, but I'm from St. Paul, not Minneapolis, and it's a common thing that people get confused with, and I just mentioned that, uh, you know, if you look at a map of the Twin Cities, you'll notice St. Paul is on the right-hand side, and is associated with people that are a little smarter, a little more clever, a little more attractive, a little more charming. Minneapolis is on the left-hand side, people who maybe don't have those qualities. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, but I said, you know, it's no problem. People get that confused all the time. And I was said, I'm just very happy that, uh, you know, while they mixed up the cities, they got the states' rights that uh, they said I was from Minnesota. Um, a lot of people hear from the Midwest and they get it confused. And uh, they'll get Minnesota sometimes confused with Wisconsin. And kind of the same rule applies. People on the right-hand side are a bit more attractive, a bit more intelligent, <laughs> uh, a bit more clever. People on the left-hand side, you know, not so much. So uh, anyways, big Viking Packer rivalry. Um, but anyways, uh, going on, uh, I'm going to talk today about retro games in education. So I talked about one aspect of this at the conference last year. How many people were at the conference last year? Okay, a couple familiar faces. Good. Uh, so some that are new. Uh, and I didn't want to do the same speech uh, that I did before. So uh, I kind of broke this down into three sections. I'm going to talk a little bit about how uh, retro gaming evolved um, and kind of the ideas that we had uh, at St. Paul College and how to do this. And then for the second part, this is a, a little bit, we'll see how well this works out. Uh, I'm going to briefly show kind of how I present this in one of my classrooms. Uh, and it's just a small section of game. We're not going to go from start to finish. It's just one small step. Um, and I wanted to kind of show that and then talk about that uh, after we're done, how that, uh, how that goes about uh, that we have there. So. Uh, starting off with our motivation, uh, in both computer science and in digital graphics, we get a lot of students that pick this major uh, at our college because they like video games. They, they enjoy playing video games. They know it's a huge industry. Uh, they know it's constantly expanding, um, and, and they want to get into that. Whether they're a coder or whether they're a designer, um, you know, they're excited about it. Uh, the hassle, that, not hassle, the challenge we're faced with is we're a community college. It's a two-year college. So for a full-time student, that's four semesters from when you start, and we assume you know, you know, we have a variety of different exposures, so we have to start with the basics that first semester, and within four semesters, um, you know, have them ready for some kind of uh, employment opportunities and things like that. So it's a little bit more of a challenge compared to a four-year college, you know, where we can stretch that out over a little bit of time. Uh, and one of the big things is. Um, a lot of students come in and, yeah, I really love these games on the PlayStation and the Xbox. I want to do that. And can I do that by the third week of my first semester here at college? You know, and I have to go through and say, you know, one person doesn't create <coughs> Assassin's Creed. Um, it's a team of 100 people, experts. Some are programmers, some are designers, some are audio engineers, some are uh, usability testers. There's, you know, a huge team. There's managers, all that kind of stuff that uh, while, yes, these games are certainly fun, and if that's your long-term goal, hey, we, I support that uh, 100%, um, but it might be kind of unrealistic to expect that, um, to be able to do that. However, 
um, in thinking about that, I thought, you know, retro gaming, designing retro games um, would definitely be possible. Uh, retro gaming, uh, we were at the, uh, the arcade last night, uh, you know, and they had a lot of examples there. Um, and uh, when I think of retro gaming, I think of, you know, 80s and 90s arcade games, 1980, 1990 arcades games, and some of the home consoles. Uh, people remember the original Nintendo Entertainment System uh, out there, the Atari 2600. That's, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, that I sort of remember uh, as a teenager, that, that sort of area. And then, like, uh, like we said, at the arcade last night, games like, uh, like Donkey Kong, this was one of my favorites uh, that we had here, stuff like that. These, again, are simpler, a lot simpler than Assassin's Creed, um, but, um, but, you know, they are complex. As far as the creation of them goes, they can be rather complex. And we can use them as a great example in order to teach programming concepts as well as, um, you know, design concepts and planning and usability and all those sorts of good things. So we kind of decided um, retro gaming, it sounds like a, a good idea. Uh, the sort of next step is how are we going to create this stuff? We have these students that want this. Um, what platform, what game development platform uh, are we going to use? And there's plenty that are available. For the last 15 or 20 years, please, no booze at this next one, um, the Adobe animation tool, which shall not be named, uh, with ActionScript has, has been the primary way we've uh, been able to animate on the web as well as have interactivity. We click on buttons and things happen. Um, but uh, since it's not HTML5 compliant, um, that's been going kind of uh, downward. You know, Adobe's trying to, to do some other things, and we can talk about that at the, at the end of uh, my presentation here. Uh, but there's some other things out there. Uh, there's a couple platforms specifically designed to make games. So Unity, Game Maker, and Game Salad are the three that I've looked at. Um, and Unity has a lot of, you can do 2D and 3D games. How many people have had exposure to at least one of these? Okay, so um, these, are, these are the three that I've looked at. Anybody used any others? Shoutouts? Okay. Um, anyway, so there's, there's these platforms, we can make games with them. Um, but we've actually decided um, in our department to go with Tumult Hype. And when I tell this to some people, um, they'll say, you know, Tumult Hype, it's, yeah, you know, they, we, we've seen two presentations that kind of talk about how Tumult Hype and iBooks work, uh, and people are, you know, it's not specifically designed for games. We can do web animations and stuff like that, but, you know, these other ones are, you know, targeted, um, you know, game salad. You, all you can do is, not all you can do, but you can, you know, it's designed, its main purpose is to create games. So why did you do that? Well, a couple reasons. One, um, I have to talk to administration, my bosses, uh, and one of the big things that they're going to look at is, okay, students want to make games, what's the employment outlook look like? Um, especially, what can we do inside of two years and guarantee that the students that work hard at this can find some, some, some good paying jobs and also probably local jobs? We're a community college. The vast majority of our graduates, after they graduate, stay within the Twin Cities area. Um, you know, a four-year college, people often go to a four-year college and, you know, specialize a little bit more, and then if they specialize in some area that's only in California, you know, the industry is mainly in California or some other particular centers, they move around. But looking at our students, we know that the vast majority will stay in the Twin Cities. So um, we kind of thought a, a little bit about this, and we realized that if you're using Tumult Hype to create games, uh, you're going to learn JavaScript. Uh, we found ways to kind of incorporate a little bit of PHP in there for like, you know, server side stuff. You know, if you have a high score and go and post that and, you know, update that. Uh, you're obviously going to apply what you've learned in Photoshop and Illustrator uh, and some of the other graphics classes. We're going to be able to include sound design, usability, uh, and we already have classes in these areas. Um, so in pitching this to, to my administration, one, I said we won't have to build this from ground up, that we fortunately already have... Um, you know, these classes will just kind of slide uh, Tumult Hype inside here and, and add these game classes. Uh, and I'll talk about this later on. The other big thing is they will start off being really excited about games, learn these things, and if they decide, you know, I really enjoy games, um, but gosh, on my resume, I already have proficiency in JavaScript, proficiency in Photoshop, proficiency in Illustrator. Uh, I can find a lot of web-related jobs that are looking for uh, these particular qualities. So even if we don't 
spit, uh, we don't uh, churn out 20 game designers. We'll have people that have, um, you know, the, those keywords that you can put on your resume that, uh, if they're good at it, can guarantee some, some wonderful employment opportunities that we have here. So uh, that's kind of our, our, our motivation uh, that we've had here in our department. So um, with that, um, okay, so we've decided we're going to use, we want to create retro games, we're going to use hype. Uh, the next thing is we need to make some games. Uh, so just kind of in my spare time, I started dinging around with this, and uh, I found it kind of fun, so it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not really not hard work for me. Um, but I've gone in and created multiple games. I kind of create a rough draft first, and then I go back and figure out how's the best way to present this in a classroom environment. So some of those games are, uh, we did a, I've done a slot machine style game. Uh, and again, we're using random numbers here. Um, and we're using global variables to keep track of the score, and we've got some usability, so uh, we click on stuff and spin, you know, and we've got, again, just like in a casino, we've got bells and lights and ding, 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 you know, all that kind of stuff uh, that we have here. Uh, I went in and recently, one of my favorites, um, actually on the very, very old Apple IIe, Sabotage, does anyone remember this game? Maybe if, if we have time at the end, I can show an example. Uh, this one's actually kind of fun. Um, uh, I'm going to use these two words together, and some people will disagree. It's fun because it uses trigonometry. Um, <laughs> some of my students, oh, trig, oh, panic attack. Uh, but to figure out you know, how to calculate the bullets are going off at this angle, you know, you're using sine and cosine and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, and I'll show examples. You have this little gun, and you turn it around and you know, shoot the little commando guys coming down here. Um, I did uh, this one. Just a generic sprite sheet kind of game. You got a little timer. A guy runs around. You have to pick up the coin, and every time you pick it up, it randomly jumps someplace else on the screen. Um, using sprite sheet animation is again understanding the concepts of that for people that are game designers are really is really valuable. Also, doing it in hype, we get an idea of how with cascaded style sheets, how positioning and moving a background image around. Uh, you know, it's a real good practical example of how that works. Uh, and then lastly, I created a, uh, this is, I think, the only game I created with Hype Pro. Um, all these other ones were with the, uh, with the standard edition. Uh, so this one uses a phys the physics engine and models collisions and stuff. And again, I took it from the Price is Right, the, the Plinko game where they put the chip down and it bump, 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 you know. And if it falls down in this category, you get a lot of points. If it falls here, you don't get anything. Um, and there's some other animations and, and fun things that, uh, that we put in here. So these are some of the examples um, that I've created. I've actually created about 12 of them, uh, and I have, uh, if you check out my website, uh, darrenscorner.com, you can see some of the examples. I've got about 12 of them, uh, and uh, we'll, again, if we have time, we'll, we'll play them at the end of, end of class here and kind of take a look at class. End of my presentation. <laughs> Old habits die hard. Um, at the end of my, my presentation here. So, um, today I thought, um, again, I talked to Bradley about this, and I thought I'd show, I've had this class, Special Topics in Computer Science, and I thought I'd run through a, a small little section of the game creation process. And I'm keeping, a, keeping an eye on my uh, stopwatch here to make sure I, I don't go over time here. But kind of show people what I've been doing in class so far and get some feedback um, from people. Uh, and I thought I'd show you um, a, one of the first games that we create, and it's a, a trivia game. So we create this in Tumult Hype. We're going to be using JavaScript. You'll see some graphics in there as well, uh, some animation. And I think I always like it. It's a great first project for the game class. Uh, it's not as flashy as you know something with bullets and shooting and, and things like that, but it helps people learn a bunch of things. One, the hype interface. Two, practical coding. Three, design. Before we actually start coding this, you know, kind of storyboarding out, figuring out the flow of things, how are we going to organize our, our uh, graphical assets? What do we want to happen when we click here? How do we prevent, how do we think about, you know, preventing people from cheating and double clicking and, you know, doing things like that? So uh, I'm going to show this here, uh, and it's going to look something like this. Um, I was, my inspiration was after a very long and slightly difficult day of teaching, I stopped by Buffalo Wild Wings um, and, uh, and was having a beverage, and they have those little trivia boxes, you know, where they ask you movies and history and stuff like that. So I thought, oh, I can, I can do that. that. I can do that in hype. That's pretty easy. 
So uh, that's what I'm going to kind of walk you through here. And I'm only going to show you part of the process. I'm going to start, um, I've broken it down into about a nine-step process. Uh, I'm going to start kind of in the middle at, at part five uh, and just show you a little bit of what we're doing, what we've done before and after that, um, and, and we can go there. Uh, I actually have a complete YouTube tutorial series that I just put up a, a little while ago, uh, and I'll point that out a little bit later. So um, to get an idea of what this looks like, give me a second here. Um, I'll just show you an example. Here we go. Trivia tutorial. There we go. Um, we can see I have uh, U.S. President Trivia by Darren Pearson start. And when I click the start button, uh, it loads this page. Question one of five. The first president of the United States to die while in office was. And the sooner you click in, anyone know? I'll click in now. William Henry Harrison. Okay. And he died only after 30 days in office. So I got 100 points, score 100. You can see it updates. And then this page reloads. And you give you about three seconds to read the, uh, read the thing. Anyone know? Six Semper. Six Semper Tyrannus. Good. Yep. I was hoping it was in vino veritas. In wine, I speak the truth. Uh, but it, no, it was thus always to tyrants. But we've seen these kind of games here before. So we're going to show how we do this in hype and how we organize it, uh, or show you just a small piece of that. So I'm going to kind of walk through that right here. Um, and again, keeping an eye on time here. I'll open up my file right there. OK, yeah, looks good. OK, let me make this full screen so I jump away from the PowerPoint stuff for just a little bit here. Um, we can see this is part five. So at this, I've, we've gone through four stages. And again, we started with kind of a blank hype canvas. We've created three scenes that you can see over there on the right side, uh, and they're called Splash, Main, and Credits. Um, and, uh, and we also have some animation in the second scene, in the main scene. Uh, yeah, it's good, good enough to read, I think, right there. Uh, we can see, again, it's a bit generic. It says question XX of YY, uh, score is zero, and then I just have question, 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 just kind of filler content, answer A, answer B, answer C, answer D. Um, but the animation looks something like this. You can see this is in the main timeline. If I just hit play, I give them about three seconds, and then we start counting down from 1,000. Uh, every half second, we decrement it. Um, and we can kind of see by 13 seconds, we're down to zero. So we've got that little piece of animation inside there of the values changing, and we're moving. So we can kind of see we're going to add now a little bit of JavaScript. Now, this is when I... When I've taught this in the past, I've taught it to a class called Special Topics in Computer Science. And I let uh, anyone in there who's taken either or my basic class in Tumult Web Design or client-side programming. So either half the people in there are coders who know JavaScript, half the people in there are graphic designers who, um, who know Tumult hype. Um, so knowing that half of them don't have not had too many, any experience in coding I pretty much, for that class, let me move this around here, part five, uh, I pretty much give them the code, but then I explain it to them. So I don't want it to be just you know, black magic or anything like that. Um, and I'll do what I do right here. Give me a second. View, oops, view, text display, show fonts. Let's make this a tad bigger. People in the back can see this. Now this file is a uh, simple text file and has a .js extension, so it's an external JavaScript file. Um, and if we look at the, the first part, it just says function get info. So I'm going to create this function called get info, and inside it, we can see there's a curly brace here, and then we go all the way down here, there's a closing curly brace. Uh, we just have these variables, and some of them are numeric and some are strings. So the first couple are numeric, window.number of questions equal five. So in my trivia example, I'm going to ask, you, ask them five questions. If we want to do ten questions, we can do that. Uh, and then I have some other things. Uh, window.current slide is zero. Window.current score is zero. Uh, I use the window prefix because I found in, in hype, um, if I want to transfer a variable from scene one to scene two to scene three, I kind of have to use global variables. And this is the easiest way I've found to do that. It's maybe not the most coding efficient way, but it, it works. Uh, if people have some suggestions, you know, later on, let me know. 
Uh, and then we can see here we have this uh, window.title, and then we have the string US President Trivia. So the cool part about this example for my students is we go through and we build a game on US presidential trivia, then they can go in and customize it, and if they want to do a game on baseball trivia or Harry Potter trivia or you know, uh, you know, movie trivia or you know, pick, your, pick your interest uh, that you have right there, it's very easy to do that. They don't have to change the height file, they just read in a new data file. So I did my best to make it modular. Uh, inside here I have a window.questions, and this, for people who haven't done a whole lot of JavaScript, uh, is what they call an array. So it's one variable, but it's a container that has five values in it. And the first string says, the first president of the United States to die while in office was, that's the first question we're answering. And then after we're done with that first slide, we reload that slide and ask the second question. John Wilkes Booth's Booth shouted the following phrase after shooting President Lincoln. Uh, and if we go back and look at the hype file, kind of the, oops, not the PowerPoint, the hype file, uh, we can see that we have this initial splash screen, and then we have this main screen. In this main screen, it says question XX of YY. So the first time this loads, we want to do question one of five. And you know, after, we, after they click the response, we do calculations. And then reload this question two of five, question three of five, question four of five. And when we finally get to the end, after we ask our last question, then we're going to jump to this C, which then tells you how many, how many you got right, what was your overall score, and uh, you know, give you some options and things like that. So uh, if we go back and look at that, we can see this is an array of questions. I then tell which are the correct questions. For the first answer, D is the correct question. For the next one, it's C, so on and so forth. And then if you remember, I have answer A, answer B, answer C, answer D, answer E. Only one of them is right that we have there. Um, and so answer A, I'm going to say Zachary Taylor for the first time it loads, James Polk for answer B, John Tyler, William Henry Harrison, which is the correct answer for D, and Martin Van Buren for E. So, and then we go through and we can see here's the A, B, C, D, and E for um, you know, the second time it loads, the third time. And then we have a little response down here. We can see the string that tells you, you know, Henry Harrison died after 30 days in office. Six separate tyrannists roughly translates to thus always to tyrants, stuff like that. So uh, get an idea a little bit of how that works. Now to integrate that into hype, uh, it's pretty easy. We open up our resources folder. And if I just hit the plus sign and say add file, I browse around and I find this file with a .js extension and bring it in. So at this point, I brought trivia.js in. If I create a custom function inside of Tumult Hype and just use the words get info, I can then read all this information in statically. And again, I could have hard coded this in, but you know, I, this, this approach makes it a little bit more modular so people can customize stuff. So, We've got that written in. Uh, next, I have, again, this is what I do for my students. Um, I tried my, oops, and I gotta, again, make this bigger. There we go. Um, this is kind of what it looks like when we create a function in Tumult Hype. It gives us this little blank, um, you know, this little template with a couple lines, and then we can code stuff. And what I do is I tell my student, you know, I tell them, Make sure you use all your unique IDs. They all match exactly as I presented. And then copy and paste this in, and I explain what it does. So I'm just going to do that right here. I'm going to go back to my hype project, and on the splash page, I'm going to say, I'm going to go over here to scenes and say on scene load. I have various actions. I'm going to choose run JavaScript. And under here, I'm going to say create a new function, and I get this little tab. And they call it untitled function, so I'm just going to erase that and call this initialize splash. Because I'm going to, again, and put these initial values in the splash page. And I'm just going to copy these four lines. Copy, go into here, and paste. There we go. Uh, now what these lines do is... First line, get info. It runs that function that I loaded in from that external JavaScript file. So now I know window.title, window.answer A, window.answer B. Then I go in and run this command. Now let's look at the splash page to see how this lines up. In the splash page, 
this says trivia title here. And we saw in my example it said US President Trivia, right? Uh, if we look at the unique ID, I call this thing Title One, T-I-T-L-E-1, all lowercase. So I have this command, I say, look in the hype document, find the element with the unique ID Title One, and set his inner HTML equal to window.title. Inner HTML is the stuff that you type in. Window.title was defined here, where window.title says US President Trivia. So I'm able to change that string. So again, if they say Harry Potter trivia, it says Harry Potter trivia. Um, then the last two lines, this is just for me for testing. I put in a couple alerts. I take these out when we get to the final version. But I just put in there are, and I echo back window.number of questions. It should say five questions in this. And I do another alert that says the first question will be window.questions bracket zero. So I put this into hype. Let's, do, let's save it, file save, and preview. And I got all my other windows popping up. Let me close these down. There we go. And I'll refresh it. There we go. So when it loads, again, I first get my alert. There are five questions in this example. I'm echoing back the variable. The first question will be, uh, the first president of the United States to die while in office was, and this now says US President Trivia. So I've read that string in for this page. I've also read in those global variables of all the questions and all the answers uh, that we have right there. So, and if I hit the Start button, we jump to the main theme, but we can see now, again, it still hasn't been customized. I'm gonna change that in the next step, and then we'll be done with this. Um, the next step, I'm gonna create a function called initialize main that's gonna do these things. So I'm just gonna copy this stuff in, copy, I go here and in this time I'm going to choose my main scene, go up to scenes and say on scene load, run JavaScript. I'm not going to choose initialize splash, rather I'm going to create a new function that's going to be called initialize main. Oops, right there. And paste this in. Init. I get it. Yeah, I got it there. Bifocals. <laughs> uh, anyways, I think I got that. There we go. So what this function does, the thing to remember with this function, I'm going to read, this page gets loaded once. This page is going to get loaded, in my case, five times because I've got five questions. So each time it loads, I run initialize main. So let's take a look at what that does. Um, I first put in a couple alerts. Uh, I first say the current slide is set to window.currentslide. It should read zero the first time. The next time I load the page, I'm going to increment it to be one, two, three, four, five. Uh, and then I say the current score is set to, and I echo back, window.currentscore. Again, all those values were initialized in that uh, JavaScript function. I also create kind of a, a little variable that I use later on in step six and step seven. Window.answer clicked is false. As soon as they click on answer A or answer B, it changes it to true and it will prevent them from like clicking on the correct answer 20 times and bumping up their score. Um, next, I do this, these two lines. Uh, and if we look at the document, question XX of YY, I called that info display. And score colon zero zero zero, I called that score display. So the code says, go into the, the hype document, get the element with the unique ID info display, and set the inner HTML equal to this stuff. And I have some variables there. Question window.current slide plus one of window.number of questions. So when I load this the first time, it should say question one of five. And then later on, I'll have some code that will increment this, so then it will say question two of five the next time it loads. Three of five, four of five. And then this one does the same thing, except I'm changing score displays in our HTML to read score colon window.currentscore. So again, as the score gets updated, we get that. Next, these six lines change the content. Right now, it says question, 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 question. And I want it to say, you know, the first president to die in office was. So I say, go into the document, find the element with the ID question display, which is this guy. Let me pull it up here. 
uh, question display, that's question, 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 and change his inner HTML to read window.questions bracket window.current slide. And again, this is where the, the JavaScript, if you, have, if you haven't worked with JavaScript, it can get a little complex. But basically, that means window.questions bracket zero, window.current slide, is the first president of the United States to die while in office was, and we echo that in there. Uh, and then I go in and I do the same thing. I do this five more times for answer A, B, C, D, and E. I've created unique IDs for answer A display, set their inner HTML to window.answer A, and then the current slide. So we're able to change the inner HTML. And then the last, these last five things, I force the visibility of all five answers to be visible. Um, and what that is, is you don't need it the first time this loads, but when you reload the page, the, the wrong answers fade out over time. We're going to have that, so we, I'm just going to guarantee that when this page reloads, everything's visible. So if we test that out, again, I plop the code down in there. Let's hope I did it right. I'll preview it. Again, I get my alerts for the splash page, and when I click start, now I should get two alerts. The current slide is set to zero. Okay, I'm reading that correct. The current score is set to zero, okay. Uh, and we can see it now says question one of five. Score is zero, and it put in the first president to die while in office was, and it put in the right values. Now the bummer was, because we had those alerts there, the animation, you know, I took my time clicking on those alerts, the animation actually started in the background. So eventually I'll take the alerts out. I just put those in just to make sure things are working the way we, sp we expect them to. So I'll actually do that right here. I'm going to comment out those two alerts and these two guys. Just put a couple forward slashes. And if I preview it now, start, okay, waits three seconds and then starts sliding down here. So I've successfully read everything inside there. So that's just step five that we have of this process. Does it make sense? How many people dozed off, eyes rolled back? Okay. So again, it, it, coding isn't everybody's bag, um, but, uh, but uh, I think it, it, this is a pretty good example. Um, so let's go in, let me go back to my PowerPoint here, uh, and I actually want to start from, I made a few notes, these, these were notes just for me, uh, but I'll start right here. I didn't want to do that. Two seconds, there we go. Start from current slide, there we go. So, um, I only have you know, so much time to speak here. If we, had, if we had you know four hours of time, I could walk you through the whole process, but you know, that's, I don't wanna, don't wanna do that. Um, remaining steps after step five here, well, we need to randomly remove the wrong answers over time. Um, so we need to put some code in to do that. We need to pick, figure out when people have clicked on an answer and figure out if it's the right answer or the wrong answer, and did they click in when the points value was 1,000 or 500 or 200, something like that. Uh, update the score based on our response. They click the right one and we update the score. Do we penalize them if they got the wrong one? Um, and then show the uh, variable window.response. That's the thing that you know William Henry Harrison died after 30 days. John Wilkes Booth shouted this and it means this. Um, and then determine the last step. Are we at the last question or do we reload the main slide? So determine if there's more questions to display or do we jump to the final credit scene. So this is, again, what we've done in the classroom. Uh, and then we can go in, uh, add audio, customize the appearance, play with colors, you know, do all those kinds of, kinds of things. Um, and then, uh, I guess, lastly, export and post. Um, the big bummer, obviously, is Dropbox doesn't support type hosting anymore. Um, which, so we can either export as a you know, folder and put it on our personal website. I've actually created a little tutorial how can we can use GitHub, which is free. And again, I have my students money, you know, they're, they're always kind of struggling or something like that for money, so free hosting on GitHub, we can, we, can, we can do that with a little bit of extra work here. So, that's um, what I do. There's a complete tutorial on my website here, uh, and it has nine steps plus kind of an intro and a summary uh, to show what happens, and I also include the files you can download, so you can get all the image files and assets and the code. So, again, I try to explain what the code does 
But if, uh, you know, I found this in my class, if I give them the code, I don't have to spend a ton of time, oops, you got an uppercase or a lowercase, or you missed a semicolon, or, you know, all those little syntactical things that you do when you debug programs. Um, and also, if anybody's interested, after the seminar is over, if you go through the tutorial, uh, test it out, make your customizations. If you want to post it to Twitter, um, I just created a hashtag height trivia, hashtag height trivia game. I uh, would love to see, you know, customizations people have made. Uh, let me check how I'm doing on time. Am I doing okay here? Yeah, you're good. Okay. Um, so that's um, what we've, that's a little bit of what I do in the classroom. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit now about the, uh, the retro game program, the status of it, as well as the future. Um, one of the problems we're encountering since we put this in place is we put multiple prerequisites down before they actually start creating games. Um, and um, prerequisites are a hassle that they have to take this class and this class and this class before they get there. Um, and especially at a community college, that res results in scheduling issues. I've got a lot of students that this class is only offered fall semester on Wednesday nights from 6 to 10, and oh, my boss won't let me get off work then, so I'm going to have to wait for it, and if I can't get it now, what am I going to do? Um, you know, and that's, that's a hassle we've always encountered here. Um, so in order to get around that, for the last three semesters, I've ran a class called Special Topics in Computer Science. Um, and there's only one prerequisite, like I said earlier, they either take type or they take client-side programming. So I get that mixture of coders and, and graphic designers. Um, and that class format, since there's only one prerequisite, like I said, I get both coders and graphic designers in there in class. Uh, and as I showed in that example, I pretty much give the students the code, but then explain, kind of in plain English, what each line is doing. That this is finds this unique element, changes its inner HTML to this value. Um, and that seems to work pretty good, I, especially with my graphic design students. I say, you know, uppercase, lowercase, your unique elements are important to get those right. If you don't, they won't, it won't work. Um, so after the first three or four times they make that mistake and I come over and correct it, it usually sinks in. Um, but uh, the cool part about this, when it's done, uh, it's a two-credit class. Uh, we're usually either able to create three or four of these retro games, uh, and we walk through it together, and after we've got everything working, I give them two or three weeks to customize it um, and, uh, and come up with their own. I say, you know, I give them a list of here's... 10 things you can do, pick five off the list and change them based on what you're comfortable with. So if they're coders, they can modify the code, add more functionality, make it a little bit more efficient. If they're graphic designers, they can change the colors, the images, uh, the stuff that we use. We add audio. They can change the layout, you know, whatever else. Again, it depends a bit on each, uh, each game. Um, and uh, again, if we have time, I'll show some of the examples of what my students have done here. Um, so feedback from this class. I, we haven't done any, you know, it, it's been very informal, um, but overall I felt my students have really liked it. Um, things people have said, it's fun, they love the creativity. Again, they're making video games. Uh, again, we, I talked about before, you know, they realize, okay, this isn't Assassin's Creed, but this stuff that even has been around for 30 years, a Pong game, while it's basic to play, the, the actual logic and graphics and everything behind it are pretty complex. Um, so they're fun, they love the creativity, uh, they've got engaging portfolio projects. They didn't come up, you know, the, having a portfolio where people can click on it and interactive is a little bit more interesting than here's a Photoshop project I did, um, look at it, and I can explain the features of it. Um, they always say, okay, they learned a lot, um, especially about the area they're not new in, so that it's, you know, um, JavaScript design, audio, usability testing is a biggie. Uh, the thing that's really fun is, um, I think the fancy education word is cross-pollination. Uh, coders consider taking design classes. I get guys who are very good coders, tend to be, you know, really math is their strong suit, and they're suddenly saying, you know, I'm going to stick with coding, but maybe a Photoshop class on my resume might not be a bad idea. Uh, and likewise, I get people who are designers who are just like, oh, code's scary. After they see these examples, they go, you know, I could, I could maybe, I'm going to at least give it a try and see what happens. So, you know, I think that, that's one of the funnest things to see people considering that, as well as students interacting with each other. 
um, you know, having, having coders and designers work together and the coders giving advice on code to other students and designers giving design advice to, to coders, it, it's kind of fun to see that happen. So uh, that's been one of the really kind of surprising things uh, that's happened in the class that uh, I've really enjoyed. So that's where we're at. Some of the challenges we face, that I face, I should say, um, and again, just checking time. Um, of game development education, uh, a couple things. One is I already addressed, job placement and demand. We're, you know, we're constantly being kind of scrutinized. How many of your graduates are getting jobs after they graduate? What's their starting salary? You know, all that kind of stuff. Are they applying directly what they learned or is it indirect? Um, and again, that kind of goes back, as I mentioned, most of our grads stay local. They often don't go out to California or the East Coast or something like that. Um, and that's why this is sold as game design, but they're definitely learning web design and web development skills. So that's kind of a fallback or, or things like that uh, that's available for them. So that's kind of one of the good things we have. The other one, and this is going to always be an ongoing challenge, the, the prerequisite dilemma. At a, a two-year college, um, you know, getting all these prerequisites in place and figuring out and schedule how to do that um, uh, from an economics point, uh, my dean and other administrations like large classes. Those are economically feasible. If I run a class with only five people in it, because you know they're the only five that have met the prereqs, um, once in a while, if I really schmooze, I can get my, my dean to buy into it. But you know, consistently, she'll always, uh, you know, you're, this 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 is larger class sizes mean more tuition per person, and you know things like that. Um, so they favor large class sizes. The trouble with prerequisites, they kind of, you know, limit the number of people that can get in there. Some people will take the first prerequisite classes and realize this, you know, this career is not for me. I'm going to try something else. So we lose those students. So we get a smaller number of people, but prerequisites ensure they know JavaScript. They know Photoshop. They know Illustrator. They, I won't have to spend time in class focusing on those skills, and we can actually design games uh, that we have here. So that's always... A challenge. Um, another one is marketing, marketing and promoting our program, uh, which is not my strong suit. I, I like teaching this stuff. Going out and selling it to people, you know, is uh, is uh, is not my my strong suit. Uh, one of the things is, you know, we get a lot of students that say, "I love video games," and it turns out they really love playing video games. But if you have to do anything hard or difficult, oh, you didn't mention that, uh, you know. So, um, you know, targeting the right students that playing video games are very easy, creating video games is very hard. It requires these prerequisites and some patience and uh, things like that. And also promoting this. Uh, we want to make this exciting, but I don't want to overpromise it. You know, to some, um, especially when we have a millennial audience, you know, again, as soon as I say, no, but you won't be creating Assassin's Creed in the first semester, you know, there's a bunch of students, oh, well, this program is stupid, you know, uh, and walk away. Um, you know, so we want to get excited about it, but, you know, you show some people, oh, my dad used to play those kinds of games 20, 30 years ago. It's, that's kind of whatever. Uh, so we've got to make it exciting, not overpromise it. Uh, and the other part that's, that's hard is making sure administration and marketing understands what these classes are about. They can read the course descriptions, obviously. Um, but, you know, we want to make sure that they don't, again, oversell it or get confused of what we're trying to do here. Um, and um, especially in the last year, we've had a bit of turnover both in administration and marketing. So we have new, I, I had some old people that I got along great with and could understand, you know, and take time to explain what we're doing. And then they got, they left to go work at different places. And now I have a new set of people. Okay, I have to sit down with you and describe what we're doing and, uh, and stuff like that so that they understand what we're trying to do and how to let students, potential students, know, um, know what this is all about. So those are some of the challenges. Uh, my future plans with Hype, one, I want to develop more games. Uh, I've got about 12 already uh, that we have here, develop games and create kind of the content that I can use in the classroom to present that in individual steps moving forward. I'm um, hoping to do some side scrollers, maybe a Mario type style platformer. Um, also looking to do more mobile friendly games. I've done a couple that instead of using the keyboard, you're using buttons so you can play it on an iPhone inside your browser. Um, promoting the game design stuff at St. Paul College. Uh, we're looking at, and uh, I've, after this is over, I would love to talk to anybody who has suggestions, changing our programs, limiting the number of prerequisites. I would like to make it a goal that by the second semester, 
they could start creating games, kind of in the, the format that I have where I give them the code and they start, they copy and paste it in and then we'd have advanced classes where they're creating the code. Uh, so kind of that reorgs kind of our classes and our, our certificate program. Third, uh, I'm looking into creating a textbook. Pretty much I've just created this on the fly, out of my own mind, written it down on notes. Uh, I'd like to publish this. We saw there's that one, um, what was the textbook, uh, you know? Book about hype. Book about hype in 3.5. 3 um, I'm really interested in Minnesota. They're pushing the open education initiative. Textbook prices have gone, oh, yay, somebody knows who it is. Textbook prices have gone through the roof. Um, and especially in computer science, physics, chemistry, go to, next time you're at a college bookstore, look at like how much a chemistry book is. It's gonna be at least, on the low end, 150 bucks probably. On the high end, what, 200, 250 bucks. Um, you know, students, especially at a community college, um, typically our students, you know, are not made of money. No student, very, very few students are. But it, it's, uh, economics is really a factor. This is, um, the old model is I create a content, I give it to a publisher, um, they pay me a certain amount initially, and then for every book that's sold, I get 10% of the profits or something like that. Um, the, the Open Education Initiative is more like, hopefully, I can find some grants or something to get compensated for my time. But then I give it, and we uh, you know, give it to the, uh, this organization, and they'll take care of publishing it under a Creative Commons style license, where then people can either download it for free, or they can say, send me a USB drive with the textbook and the files on it for five bucks, you know, you're paying for the hardware, something like that, but that gets us away from $150 textbooks. Um, so that's something I'm really excited about. Uh, and then the other thing that I'm looking at or considering, and I just wrote in my notes, I gotta also now look at the iTunes store, um, publishing this on other platforms. Uh, I've thought about creating a series on Udemy or Linda, um, and now I think maybe iTunes might be a good one. Um, and the reason for that is, overall, I'm, I'm an optimist. I, I think this program's gonna fly um, if I get the right, right cooperation. Um, Long-term success for this requires co cooperation. I need other faculty members, which is going pretty good for me so far, um, as well as administration, as well as marketing, as well as IT to get cooperation with all those groups in my community college. Um, it's going pretty good so far. Um, but I do recognize that's a lot of variables that I do not control. Um, we have a lot of turnovers in these areas, so you know, I, get, I, had, I used to have a dean that really understood this, and uh, now I have a new dean, and she's, she's really nice. Um, still taking, she's you know, coming into the job, learning all these different aspects of my particular program is, is a priority, but it's, she's got a couple other things to manage. So getting their support, cooperation, making sure everybody's on board is tricky. If that doesn't happen, I personally feel this is a really cool idea. If it doesn't fly where I'm teaching, I'll look at Udemy, I'll look at lynda.com, I'll look at maybe other educational venues, uh, things like that. But I, I feel there's some value um, in, in what I'm doing here as far as both education and uh, general fun uh, that we have here. So, uh, almost wrapping up here. Uh, feel free to contact me um, about things like, again, if you have some suggestions about prerequisites in our degree, I'd love to talk to you at the end of the conference uh, or a lunch. Uh, if you know any textbook publishers, um, I would, or have you, if you have experience with online publishing, things like that, especially in an educational environment, um, if, you're, if, you, if your college or school is, is interested in this, you know, talk to you, I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, if you have some ideas for new games, I'd love to hear that. Uh, the last one, I've got a lot of students who um, are curious about this, and I've been meaning to look into it, but it's a matter of how much time you have in a day. Um, how can we bring hype, take the output of hype, which is HTML5 and JavaScript, and move it into the App Store? And I know there's a tool called PhoneGap that kind of does that. I've been meaning to explore it. I haven't had a chance to do that. If anyone has any experience, how can I take the output of hype and move it into either the Android or the iOS app store and download this as an app instead of as a web page. Um, if people know how to do that or know resources how to do that, I would love to, uh, I'd love to pick your brain. I'll, I'll take you out for dinner or something tonight and uh, you know, get some ideas from you. So if you want to contact me, my email is dpearson100 at gmail.com. I'm on Twitter at dpearson100. And uh, lastly, 
Uh, my website, darrenscorner.com, shows uh, some of the games, and you can also contact me there. It also has the tutorial and the, the instructional files if you want to download and, uh, and, and do that and, and post the games, um, you know, uh, make your own modifications and see what, uh, what kind of changes occur there. Okay. So, <laughs>